to live with the atmosphere you're feeling when you wake up in the morning. You choose the atmosphere you want to live in. When we gather as God's people, whether it's in a small group in a home, or whether it's in a large group like this, again, we choose what we bring into that atmosphere. And some of us are living perhaps a little bit tired, and we've got used to allowing the atmosphere around us to shape the way that we feel. So I really appreciated Rick and the team this morning helping us to cut through the anxiety that's in the world, the fear that tries to come on us, the sense of, oh, ah, breathe. And instead saying, let's come in, let's lift up, let's praise the Lord. It's a choice that we make. It's a choice you can make every day. It's a choice that we make in our home churches. It's a choice in a neighborhood. You can decide on the street you live in what's allowed to take place and what's not allowed to take place. Not by knocking every door and telling them. That might get you in trouble. But by deciding, Lord, I live here. I want this to be a place filled with your presence, with your safety, and with your joy. And so I'm taking charge right now this morning by praying. And if you've got a friend nearby, a relative nearby, maybe gather together and you do a prayer of agreement. This street, Lord, we declare, comes <clears throat> under your authority, comes under your grace. I speak your peace over this area. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So I'm saying you get to choose. You don't have to be a victim that goes with whatever's going on around you. You become a person who carries the life of Christ and you can spill out the life of Christ wherever you choose to. Internally for yourself, in your family, over your kids, in your singleness, in your business, as we gather, Lord, this is going to be a place of fruitfulness. This is going to be a place of joy. So just turn to your neighbor and just tell them, you get to choose. Choose well. If you don't choose, you are actually making a choice to come under whatever is going on around you. So there's no such thing as no choice. You either just choose the atmosphere around you on your street, in your home, or the, the fear the enemy tries to come in with, or you choose to rise above it and know who you are in Christ, who Christ is in you, and that you have authority that's been given to you. Honestly, that message in two minutes there is enough for us. We can go home now. But we're not, because I've got a little bit more. This morning, I'm going to give you three invitations. I've titled this, I'm going to give you three important invitations. About seven years ago, I got an email, and uh, the email didn't look very official, but it said, you are invited by Theresa May, who was then Prime Minister, to afternoon tea at 10 Downing Street. I read it through, it looked a bit dodgy, so I deleted it. <laughs> Has anybody ever done that? You have an inheritance in some African nation, and if you will send me your bank details... So I just thought, this is a scam. They're going to ask me to click a link to reserve my place, then ask me for my bank details for some weird... Re so I just thought, save myself the hassle, delete this invitation. I got home later that day, and Esther had had the same invitation to her. So it got me thinking, maybe it's legitimate. So I fished it two days afterwards, fished it out of my trash folder, and I then forwarded it to Chris Horton and said, Chris, would you check this? Do you think... I mean, if somebody's going to hit a link, I'll let you hit the link. Um, <laughs> Don't spoil my inbox, and I don't want to get any spam. Or He checked it out. He said, it actually leads you to a government website when you do hit the link to RSVP. 
So I, I, I did, we, we kind of hit and we both agreed to go. We were asked to send our passport as identification, like a photocopy, we did it. We booked the trains and like two weeks later, we're on a train down to 10 Downing Street, dressed really nicely. And I'm saying to Esther, I still don't know. When we turn up to Downing Street, <laughs> the police officer on that road may just say, I have no idea who you are. It might be worse than that. So we get off the train, we walk the little bit that we have to, we get to 10 Downing Street, and uh, I just show the invitation on my phone. I have my passport on me as a means of identif identification. And do you know what? They allowed us in. <laughs> they were expecting us. I was on their list, Esther was on their list, and we both walked down 10 Downing Street, very surreal. And to the door, we were allowed into Downing Street and a part of a tea party at 10 Downing Street. So I'm glad I didn't leave that in the trash folder. It was an important invitation. It allowed me access into a sacred space with about and maybe 80 others. It wasn't just me and Esther and Theresa May. There was about 80 other church leaders from around the UK that had been invited in to that setting, along with some of the cabinet and some other officials. Well, today, I believe that God is extending to us, and if you're watching online, to each of us, three invitations that I think each of them are more important than the invitation I received a few years ago. The invitation a few years ago didn't change my life. It allowed me into a corridor of power. I took some selfies outside of 10 Downing Street. I used to have a brown briefcase. I even stood outside next door and held it up and took a selfie of that as well. As... <laughs> so I, I enjoyed the moment. It was fun. It didn't change my life. What I'm about to invite you to will. So the kind of second half of my message is going to be the three invitations. Before I give you those invitations, I want to help you to understand why you are receiving those invitations. Uh, in 1 Chronicles 12.32... We know this really well. It says that the people of Issachar, they understood the time and they knew what they ought to do. I would give you three things from that verse. Understand the time, know what to do, and then do what you know to do. The challenge for many of us today, we live in a house, this church family, that constantly shares about the times. Very easy to pick up revelation about what God is saying and what God is doing. So knowing, and knowing what time it is, knowing what to do, is only two-thirds of a three-part equation. The third part is you must do that which you've been told to do. Anybody, does that make sense? I've often focused on you must know what time it is, you must know what to do. But if you know what time it is and you know what to do, but you still don't do it, you are none the wiser, no better off. In fact, James 1.22 would tell me that if that happens, deception will come into your life. Why? Because James says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what the word says. He said, if you only hear the word and you don't do what it says, you're like a person who gets up in the morning, looks in the mirror, sees what needs to be corrected, but walks away and forgets. Forgets that their hair is out of place, that they've got a big mark on their face, and they haven't done their teeth. They look in the mirror, they take stock, and then they walk away and forget. I think many people have been hearing God's word, hearing what he is saying, appreciating it, but then walking away from the mirror and not doing anything about it. Just help me one more time, turn to your neighbor and say, it's time for obedience. There has to be some action from what God is asking from us. If things don't change, that James 1.22, deception comes in. And the problem with deception is if you're deceived, you won't know you're deceived. Somebody's tricked you but actually you allowed the door to be open to be deceived by simply not following through on what God showed you. I don't know if you understand how important it is as soon as God shows you something that requires action 
that you say yes to it and you move forward on it. You obey it. So before I give you the three invitations, I'm saying that. Here's, I like the word three today, obviously. Here's three things about the time. So knowing what to do is because we know what time it is. Here's three things in helping understand the times. And first one is simply this. Our world has changed and continues to change. Anybody know that's true? We are not living in the world I grew up in. I sound really old when I say I grew up in 35 years ago. I would have been 15. The world has massively shifted. And Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20 and 21, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Would you agree with me that we live in a culture now that calls good evil and evil good? Calls sweet bitter and bitter sweet. And that our culture seems wise in its own eyes. We don't need you telling us what's right and wrong. We don't need you telling us how marriage works or doesn't work. We don't need you to tell us how humans are made to flourish. We don't need Father God, you telling us how family works or how society works. We have become wise in our own eyes. I don't know about anybody else. I look around and it scares me. Is it just me? <laughs> I think there is a the world has changed, and it continues to change. I think there's also not only that, but there's a hostility, there's an anger, there's an angst like I've never known in my time on the earth. And I'm not going to go into all of this. The development of AI, and there's loads happening with that. Robotics and AI, I don't know what we will be walking on the streets with in the next 20 years. I don't know what will happen when governments take AI and use it to do warfare on other nations or use AI to help develop computer stuff that they can... I, I don't know. I'm not trying to go there. I'm not trying to upset you. I'm just saying the world has changed. We have moved from a generally a biblical worldview to a very anti-biblical worldview. And some of us in the church are embracing what those voices are saying because we don't know our Bibles well enough. We don't know history well enough. And we are not rooted in truth. Truth is not subjective. That simply means I don't decide what's true. It's a, 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 two plus two is... I heard somebody say recently, well, if you want it to be five, it can be five. I'm like, are you serious? Your mortgage company will not agree. <laughs> if they say you owe us 850 pounds this month, and you say, well, truth is subjective. I think I only owe you 500. You will be kicked out of your house. Yeah. Truth is not subjective. It's objective. And ultimately, Jesus is truth. But we now are living in a world where people who are academically qualified, you would think they would speak truth and be sensible, seem to have lost their sensibilities. The world is changing, and we're living in that world. It's anti-biblical worldview. And I'll just simply say this, persecution is coming. Second thing I would say is difficult seasons lie ahead. And I know you're thinking, you're full of great news today. The third one's good news. Difficult seasons lie ahead. Um, two significant words Esther and I have had in the last few weeks. One is, I had it two weeks ago, woken up about quarter to 1 a.m. in the morning, and I heard the Lord very strongly say to me, storms are coming and my people are living unaware of what's coming. 
I'm not original in saying it. God has been saying this for a while and he's saying it through multiple voices. Second word we had is you are in the eye of the storm. We felt the Lord saying, do you know what the eye of the storm is? Those nations that have big storms, the storm hits, everything's disrupted, you know, trees can be uprooted, roofs come off houses, cars can be flipped, and then it goes as quiet as a nice sunny day, no wind blowing, it's calm. And people come out of the bunkers, and they come out of their shelters, and they think everything's okay, and 15, 20 minutes later, the back end of the storm comes. The storm was circular with a hole in the middle, and in the center of the storm, it's as quiet as anything. And what they were experiencing, they were in the eye of the storm. And when the back end comes and people aren't ready, it can cause more devastation than the first thing that they went through. I'm really not trying to frighten you, but I do believe, and I haven't got time to go through Matthew 24, Jesus was asked the question, what will be the sign of your coming? The sign of the end of the age. And he listed nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, earthquakes, what we've been living through, pandemics. The love of most will grow cold. People will fight one another. And he encourages them to stay true. The reason I'm not reading it is if I go there, I will live the whole message there because I, I believe it's apt for today. But look up Matthew 24 when you get home and read it through. He finishes in verse 13 and 14 by saying, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Are you standing firm? The three invitations I'll give you as we close this in a few moments time is to help you to stand firm. And the last verse, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And this isn't my message today. Stand firm and get involved in the gospel proclamation to the ends of the earth. And so we're going to see great persecution, trial, difficult times, but also a massive missionary movement to our neighbors, to the nations, everywhere in between. Many will be brought into the kingdom. And then Jesus said, then the end will come. Somebody say, wow. wow. Say it backwards. Wow. Say it upside down. Mom, no. <laughs> I'm just trying to help you to understand. I believe we're living in that day. The hostility has increased. Stuff's happening. Third thing to help understand the times, and this is the good news, these are wonderful days for those who are followers of Christ. These are glorious days to be alive. You were born for such a time as this. I tell you that all the time. You are not an accident. You are not here primarily to enjoy holidays, make money, and have a nice house. May God bless you with money, a nice house, and a great holiday. But your purpose in life is not the same as those who don't know Christ. He'll give you good things. He'll bless you. But in fact, you were born with a divine plan hanging over your life. God wrote a story for you, fits into his story, and you're being invited in today. Isaiah 60 says, arise and shine, your light has come, the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, thick darkness the peoples, but the glory of the Lord rises upon you and appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. So I believe it's our finest hour. I believe these are wonderful days to be alive. I totally believe that they're, they're very challenging dark days, but I believe those who follow Christ will come into the fullness of who Christ has called them to be and be involved in a glorious plan that God is unfolding. And we are not to live in fear, but faith. We are to live with joy. 
We are to live in shalom, peace. And so we can be aware of all of the things I'm saying, but it is not supposed to frighten us. It is supposed to cause our roots to go deep into Christ. And no matter what blows, what wind comes, what storms come, we are rooted firmly in Him, immovable, unshakable, because we draw strength, nourishment, and joy from another realm. And in the dark world, we now become carriers of light and hope and the presence of God. The only challenge is most of the church are fast asleep. And I just simply want to say it is not business as usual. All hands are needed on deck. So here's my three invitations. I'll try and give them you concise and the way that the Lord gave me this, he just gave me three scriptures and um, I chewed on them and I felt the Lord give me these three things. So my first one would simply be your invitation, important invitation, love first. It almost sounds a bit weird to tell you all of that that's happening and then I call you to a life of love. Jesus was asked in Matthew 22 and verse 37... Well, actually, in verse 36, he was asked, and 35, what is the greatest commandment? And he replied, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. If you do this, all of the prophets and law hang on it, and love your neighbor as yourself. So here's the two things. In that one verse, love God, love people. If you've come to this church more than once, you've probably heard me say that. Because <laughs> the Lord keeps calling us back to what is called the great commandment. If it was true in Jesus' day, it's true in our day. So help me one more time by telling your neighbor... This is the great commandment. Emphasize great. Love God, love people. It speaks of relationship with God, intimacy. It speaks of relationship with others, unity, community. Esther and I have realized one of the things that the enemy's been doing is there's been a real contending for relationship. Anybody felt it in their family? It's like misunderstandings. They come so easily. Esther and I were talking this morning. We were in the car having a conversation yesterday. There was a little misunderstanding. One of us is calming the other one down. The other one is like just a bit quiet. This morning we reflect on it and say, oh, it's just a silly misunderstanding. It's only a tiny example. We didn't fall out. But we understand you contend for relationship. Anybody working in their work environment realize you're contending for relationship. Anybody in church realize the enemy is trying to attack the very thing that's going to be our place of safety. We're going to need each other. I don't have time to go into this, and I normally don't like to mention people's names off the platform. But a guy called... Uh, Torben Sondergaard, anybody followed any of what he's doing? I think he's a Denmark evangelist, and I just listened to a podcast recorded. He just spent more than 400 days in a U.S. prison for no crime. O almost impossible, worth kind of figuring out what went on there. Um, and my very, and if, if he ever listens to this, if somebody says something, I have no judgment against him. I came across him eight, nine, ten years ago, Massive evangelism, lots of door-to-door -door work, lots of street work, lots of miracles on the streets, deliverances, but a slight edge against the church. Christian, Holy Spirit-filled, lots of supernatural, and people would say, you're going to listen to this. He's amazing. You're going to listen to this. You're going to... So I did. And I thought, I love everything he's doing, but it sounds like he's got an angst against the body of Christ. And I don't like it when Christians have an angst against the body of Christ. He's just spent more than 400 days in a U.S. prison, and I believe it's a prophetic sign, with trumped-up charges against him. And he's come out now, 
And when I watch the videos, he's crying, and he's apologizing to the body of Christ. That some of the things he learned when he was in was if they have a different theology, they are still the body of Christ, and I need them. And he realized, he said, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. He said, when I was in prison, I expected certain Christians to help me. They didn't do anything. And the ones that I thought would never help me, that he'd been critical of, they helped him. And I thought, isn't that interesting? So he said, me and my wife, we've talked about it. We're going to make a big commitment for the body of Christ where they can to be in unity. It was just a little sign to me. One, persecution's coming. Two, we need each other. And it comes, if you live in love with God, you will have something to give in love to other people. We don't need to be critical of one another. We need to serve one another. So intimacy with God. Here's the second invitation. So my first invitation is to love first. And it speaks of our heart. Here's the second invitation. It's seek first. So if my first invitation, love, is all about heart, the second invitation, seek first, is all about priorities. One is about our heart, the other one is about how we prioritize. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Don't raise your hand. Anybody worried about their life? He could have written this for today. Don't worry about your life what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. And then it says, look, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap. They don't store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you, they're not even Solomon, the richest man who ever lived, in all his splendor was never dressed like one of these flowers. If this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you of, oh, you of little faith? So don't worry. Just, just pause for a minute. We're going to read the next bit in a moment. The same problem that happened in Jesus' day happens in ours. How am I going to pay my bills? How will we afford clothing? How will we heat the house? How will we pay the mortgage? Utility bills have gone through the roof. Jesus said, I do know that. My father knows what you need. He looks after birds. He dresses grass with flowers, and they look more beautiful than Solomon in all his pomp. He said, so don't worry. And don't run after that stuff like those who don't know God run after that stuff. And then he gives us a shift in priority. He says, but you seek first the kingdom of God. I want to argue with him. Anybody else? That is not going to put food on the table for the kids. He's saying it will. My head's saying it won't. He said, everybody else in your city runs after all of that stuff. He said, not you, though. You have a Father, Heavenly Father. He'll watch over you. So you change your priorities. And I think we have an option here. We either choose to watch over our own finances, our own clothing, our own housing, our own utility bills, our own day-to-day, -day, and we make that our highest priority, or we follow the advice of Jesus and say, thank you that you know what I need. I'm not going to be careless. I'm going to be a good steward. But in terms of priority, I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God. I'm no longer going to give you the leftover. I'm not going to do all of this first. And if I've got time left over, then I'll give it you. I'm not going to do all of this first, and if I've got some money left over, then I'm going to give it you. I'm not going to do all of this first, and you fill in the blank. But instead, you're asking me to shift priorities, 
not in a blind way, because you're saying, you know what I need, and my Father will help me. So prioritize my kingdom first. Somebody say, wow. I thought I'll just do it once. That's fine. I think that's powerful. I want to ask you today, where are your priorities? You don't have to tell me, but I'm going to give you 20 seconds right now. Nobody has to answer, but look your neighbor in the eye and ask them. Say, where is your priority? Go on, do it just for a moment. Here's my third invitation, and we'll close with this. My third invitation comes from Ezekiel chapter 47, and uh, verses 3 to 5. It says, as the man went eastward with the measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and then led me through water that was ankle deep. Measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. Measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in a river that no one could cross. My third invitation is to go deep, and it speaks of trust. So my first invitation is to love, and it speaks of the heart. My second invitation to you is to seek first, and it's about priority. And the third invitation is to go deep, which speaks of trust. How many know it's scary to be in water where your feet don't touch the floor? Ankle deep is okay, knee deep is okay, maybe even waist deep is okay, but to have another thousand cubits off and get in so deep that you can't stand, you can only swim, it speaks of trust. And I think the Lord is inviting us to love and to seek the kingdom and to go deep. Or you could say he's inviting us to be wholehearted, to prioritize the things of the kingdom and to trust him. It's ever so simple, but it's not easy. Simple to understand? We get that, but not so easy to work out in practice because it costs something to love people. It costs something to love God. I may have to let go of other loves because he demands all my love. I'll tell you where, where this message kind of incubated you know that we are on a journey of becoming people that obey not only the Great Commandment, but the Great Commission. The Great Commission is to go make disciples. But I'm realizing more and more, if all of that doesn't flow out of a loving God first, loving his people well, seeking the priorities of the kingdom, and going deep in trust, we'll never be able to do that stuff. It'll always be a formula that we are trying to fit into an already exasperated for life. And I think the Lord is taking us back to the scriptures, back to himself, and saying, love me. Do you know, I, 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 I am done. That's my message to you today. It's an invitation. You can hit delete on it, throw it into the trash folder and say, that's just somebody trying to help me hit, click the link and then they're going to get something off me. You may think, I think that's legitimate and it's from the Lord and it's more important than an invitation from a prime minister, so I'm going to pay attention to it. I do think if we do not obey, whether it's within the next year or month or five years, we will be caught off if we don't obey. The Lord is kindly inviting us in. I, I am hearing stories from all over the UK of young people, teenagers and early 20s, who are coming into a place 
unconnected to each other, I'm hearing them from different people, of radical devotion to Christ. I mean, like, totally all in. Stuff I haven't heard stories like this before, or I haven't heard them in decades. People who are, they could do well in life, they're, they're educated, they're, they've got a lot of promise, they have a lot of potential, but seeking first his kingdom has become the priority. Loving him well is of more value than anything else. Trusting him with everything rather than working out their futures themselves has become the default mechanism in the way that they live. I believe it's the signs of early fruit. And the Lord is asking us, be delivered from a Western value system. You belong to the kingdom. You belong to the kingdom. You're a disciple of Christ. And our fruitfulness is not dependent on learning a few principles. It all comes back to loving God with all of our hearts, seeking first the kingdom, prioritizing him, and then trusting him enough to go so deep we have to swim. We're not in control anymore. Here's how I'm going to close today. Um, if you are willing to say, Steve, I'm willing to accept those three invitations. I had to book a train. I think I'm invested in some clothes, had a haircut, canceled all my appointments for that day to say yes to an invitation. Your invitation is going to be far more costly if you say yes to this right now. And you're going to have to work out what it means for you. You might go back over this, listen to it again. But if you're saying, I say yes to the Heavenly Father and His three important invitations today, just quietly where you are, I want you to stand to your feet. I normally would pray for you right now, and I was just about to, but I just felt the Lord saying they're used to that. I want you to, we're not going to have any worship, no music, and we'll be done within about two, three minutes, and we'll give you your customary samosa. We do have people who attend the church just for the samosa. I'm hoping they make help. No, I'm joking. Um, you might say, yeah, that's me, but don't tell anyone. I want you to just turn to one other person, and I know this is embarrassing for British people to do this, and I just want you to say one thing out of what you've heard today that's a priority in what will change in the coming week. So if we're talking about loving him or others, we're talking about priorities for the kingdom, and we're talking about going deep in trust, I want you, you can have a 30 second conversation first, but make sure the person you're speaking to gives you one thing they're going to do as a result of what they've heard today. And then whenever you finish talking and praying with each other, you may pray with each other, you're dismissed. We're still in good time. Say, well done, Steve, you finished well on time. Thank you so much. I appreciate your encouragement. Um, so while you're thinking... I will say to you, because I'm not going to say this at the end, Turn Nations next Friday, Saturday, you should be there. Our coffee shop opens next week. I think that's really cool. It's got a soft opening next week. The week after, it'll open like more, and, and we'll increase the hours every day. And Ruth is here, so Ruth's be, Ruth will be running that as a cup of joy here in All Nations. Yeah, very, very good. Um, uh, our building is being cleaned up and it's going to be open to the community. We've had interest from so many parties that want to come in and use the facility. We want to engage this as a safe space for the people in Wolverhampton. So you're going to start seeing some traction, but all of it is a place of God's kingdom and God's love. So turn into twos and ask that question. What's the one thing you're going to do after what you've heard today?